Hello and welcome to A Time to Reconcile. Pastor Tom Pickett, thank you for joining with my wife and I as we record this sermon message for you today. We do want to share the, this message today because it has to do with our risen Lord Jesus Christ. The title of today's message is, Why Do We Seek the Living Among the Dead? Good question. And that was asked of Mary after Jesus was buried and on the third day she went back to finish the burial preparation for his body and he was gone. He wasn't there. But do we find ourselves spending more than 50% of our time focusing on our Messiah who is dead rather than our risen Lord who is alive? Up until Jesus died on the cross to forgive us all of our sins, that needed to be our focus. But three days later, the entire focus shifts. Now we need to consider our living Lord and Savior. And let's notice that in the scriptures. Before we get to the scriptures, please join with me in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus. Thank you for sending him to us to save us so that we wouldn't be condemned. And we are that. We now recognize that as Jesus is risen, at the resurrection of our Lord Jesus, well, He is the risen Lord. How does He live? What does He do? How is it different? Well, the Scriptures tell us these things. Now, please help us as we go through the Scriptures to see what the Scripture says, the living Word of God. We ask and pray your blessing to be upon this service, and we thank you in Jesus' most holy and righteous name. And all together we say, Amen. Well, here we are. We're on this very special occasion of the uh, resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Let's turn to uh, the Gospel of Luke 24 and verse 1 as we begin. I'm reading from the NIV version. If you have your Bible handy, why don't you pick it up and open it up to Luke 24 and read along with us. I do a lot of preaching from the Bible, and so you'll find having the Bible close to hand will be helpful to you. So, Luke 24, verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood before them, and they were angels. And in their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? Now at first they were confused when that question was asked, and they were going to have that question answered by what's going to happen after this time. Verse 6, He is not here. He has risen. Remember how He told you while He was still with you in Galilee. Now, the memories are going to be flooding back for these women, as well as the twelve disciples. And it's interesting that they had totally put that out of their mind, that Jesus was actually going to be raised from the dead. But here they are. They're dealing with it on this early Sunday morning, which we know is Easter. In verse 7, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. So, the uh, angels quoted back what Jesus said. Then they remembered his words. It's amazing how we are as human beings. See, these ladies were still in shock from his dying, and they couldn't have good memory yet. And, but once the words were said, well, he said them how many times to his disciples, which included the ladies here? Many times. And they just had suppressed it because they didn't want to think about him dying. So they suppressed his being risen as well. In verse 9, when they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. The women are really good evangelists, and they show it right here. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with him who told this to the apostles. So God used the women to be the first ones to spread the good news of the gospel. But they did not believe the women. See, that was the problem back then. 
women weren't believable. That's shameful. Because their words seemed to them like nonsense rather than happy truth. Peter, in verse 12, though, however, got up and ran to the tomb, and bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves, and he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Now, John, who was with him in uh, John's account, in uh, John 20, uh, he, uh, he, he thought that that's what had happened, that he'd been raised from the dead. But um, it took the disciples a little while to actually be able to accept that, wonderful good news. So now let's go to John the 20th chapter and verse 11. John 20 and verse 11. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying and as she wept she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her woman why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. And at this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Because she wasn't expecting to see Jesus, so she didn't. <laughs> he saw, she saw a man, but she didn't realize it was the one she was looking for. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? <laughs> don't you just love Jesus? He just loves to... You know, he, he plays along with us, not to make us look foolish, but just, you know, just uh, like someone who cares for us, but he knows what's going on with us. We're, we're just not able to get, get with it yet. And thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, you have carried him away. Tell me where you have put him, and I'll, I will get him. <laughs> and then Jesus said to her, and isn't it so amazing how important our name is to us? He said to her, what? Well, Mary, everything clicked, you know? Her name, yeah, that's me. And the tone, the inflection of Mary, how Jesus said it. Ah, how did you get there? <laughs> she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Yes, indeed. Her teacher was there, alive. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not ascended into the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And you see how Jesus automatically includes all of us in this, in this relationship. We're equal in his eyes with the relationship that he has with his father. We're right there. We're, you know, without sin as far as God is concerned. And Jesus obviously has already attributed his righteousness to us as the risen Lord. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news and I have seen the Lord and she told them that he had said these things to her. So let's continue on in John. John 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, they were in the upper room, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leader, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Jesus always does that when he knows we're stressed out. We're wondering where Jesus is. Who stole him from the, from the tomb? Uh, what's going on here? I don't understand. Uh, they were beginning to understand. John, I think, understood more than anyone at, the, at that time. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. The fa as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. See, Jesus is always sending. We think we're going to sit around and chat for a while. Well, they already had that opportunity. Three and a half years of chatting along the dusty roads and at the campfires and doing ministry in the cities. Now is a time to send. And that's where we are now in the church. We need to send people out as ministers of His reconciliation, which we have just seen that reconciliation 
his death and resurrection. We need to do the sending now. You know, we we think that only certain ones should be sent, like missionaries. Well, we're all missionaries then. But not everybody realizes that we are all missionaries to the world. And we ought to be sent. So, and with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit, which was going to be coming up on Pentecost. But it seems like to me that he gave them a, a hint of the Holy Spirit's indwelling uh, power, strengthening. Because he's going to be with him for the next 40 days, and he wanted them to understand what he was saying. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. You see, the power and the authority that he gave, not just to the church, but to the people of the church, the individuals, the disciples of the church. We all have that capacity to forgive sin because Jesus has forgiven us. And it's a sure sign that we have been forgiven. And we know the Holy Spirit has confirmed that in us. So in verse 24, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Does that sound like anybody you know? You maybe know someone like that. That could be you. I don't know. But come along, Thomas. <laughs> Let's go into the scripture even further. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. He always said that. He always knew we needed his peace. Then he said to Thomas, because he knew what Thomas felt. He knew what Thomas said. He knows what we think, what our hearts desires are put your finger here see my hands reach out your hand and put it into my side stop doubting and believe and that's what he wants us all to do stop doubting the god of this world satan he's the doubter he's the one who wants to persuade us not to believe in jesus because he doesn't want us to have life he wants us to have death but Jesus has brought us life. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Now, I don't know whether he actually put his fingers in the holes and into the side or not. He doesn't actually say that. Jesus offered that to him. But he realized he could see them, <laughs> the holes, <clears throat> with his eyes. I just think he saw the holes and he said, well, he's Jesus. I saw him on the cross at a distance, of course. So, Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's you and me today. We don't have that privilege of being that close to him in a physical way. Although we are closer than close in a spirit way because he lives in our heart today. So how is Jesus living today? Have you done much thinking about that? Uh, the risen Lord, you know, and what does that mean going forward? Well, we see that he was sending his disciples out. They were going to go from Jerusalem to all the known world, Samaria and the Roman Empire, the different parts of the empire. And as custom has it, uh, Thomas went to India, where he ministered to those in the nation and continent of India um, until he was, as I understand it, martyred by some in that place. So at Pentecost, when Jesus sent to us the Holy Spirit, the 3,000 who believed in him at that time received Jesus into their hearts. And as a matter of fact, Jesus also lives in the Father and the Holy Spirit today. He was the Word when he lived with the Father and the Holy Spirit before. Now he's Jesus living with 
and in the Father and the Holy Spirit, and we live in Him. Let's notice that over in John the 17th chapter and verse 20. John 17 and verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. In other words, our message today. We're all being sent, remember? So we all have a message. People will believe in him through our message. That all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. So there is a connection. Father and Jesus are one. And that we be that way. That we be in them, as they will tell us here. May they also be in us, see, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. So as believers, we should be one like Jesus is in the Father and we are in Jesus. Well, that's in the Spirit, and that's really close. So you can see how we could be one if we had the Spirit in us to be that one that we are. So, I have given them the glory that you have given me, that they may be one as we are one, I and them, and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity, that the world will know that you sent me, and have loved them even as you have loved me. So Jesus, who as the Word our Father loved, and then after he became Jesus our Father loved, and now the risen Lord Jesus has his son, born of him, through Mary, then you see how he loves us the same. So when we're adopted into the family, there's no holds barred. I mean, we are one in inheritance with Jesus, the same. Uh, we have all the rights of being a, a child of God. And our Savior Jesus, he's our Savior, he's also our living high priest today, and he still does ministry. He does his ministry of reconciliation still, and he wants us to join with him in that today. So, Jesus has reconciled us. He's reconciled everything in heaven and on earth, and he sustains all of creation. He does that today as we enjoy that creation being sustained. You notice that it doesn't wobble around, you know, it's in perfect alignment with all the other bodies in the heavens. And it's immense and awesome. How does it not come crashing in on itself? Well, Jesus sustains it. Over in Colossians, the first chapter, we see that our Father has given him this position as our risen Lord something he used to do before he was Jesus. Over in Colossians 1 and verse 15 it says, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. And this, as we know from those who do time studies, this was millions of years ago, according to the studies. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He's doing that right now. So, who's taking care of our planet? Jesus is. He says so. And he is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. So our Father has given him the supremacy over all things. Over all the creation he made as the Word to be our Creator. Now he's our King and our Lord and as well as our Savior. And he does the same because our Father has given him the same authority and 
with an additional plus to that because as we see here in verse 19 for God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and through him see to reconcile to himself all things so this is added to that supremacy he's reconciled everything in heaven and on, on earth and we say oh what a mess the earth is well no he created the earth to be sustainable and he has done that and is doing that today so so he, he has been able to reconcile to himself all things whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross so he has a lot of angels to help in that and then he's looking forward to having a lot of us brothers and sisters to help with that as we go into the new heavens and new earth after his return in glory. So we have a lot of wonderful things to look forward to. So Jesus sits at his Father's right hand in heaven right now among all the other things that he does and he has brought us to sit with him. <laughs> Did you know? Over in Ephesians the second chapter. Ephesians the second chapter in verse 4. Ephesians 2 and verse 4. But because of His great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgression. So since He's alive, we're alive. We're alive in the Spirit. Do you feel alive? You need to feel alive because Jesus is alive. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So He's not the only one to be raised up. Now He's the only one to be raised up in the Spirit like He is right now. We're raised up in the Spirit by still being on the earth physically and our spirit has been taken to be with Him in heaven and to be sitting with Him. Now, if you don't know that, well, you don't know that. But if you do know that and you believe the Word, you say, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, that means Jesus wants us close. He wants us to help Him do what He's doing in the world to bring it all to a conclusion. So He can come back in glory and we, as His disciples and His brothers and sisters, can say, Lord, while You were gone, I been led of your spirit and the Holy Spirit and I've been doing what you've asked me to do and we are ready we're ready to have you return in glory and we hallelujah him when that happens he's coming our risen Lord is coming to us so going back to Ephesians in verse 7, in order, so we're in heaven, seated with Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. Well, to us, you know, we're always growing in that, and to others, his incomparable grace. And we're sharing the witness, remember, we're one sent to bring to people's attention about our Lord and our Savior Jesus. And it's expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So, as He's kind to us, we're kind to others. Because that's who we are. We're born from above in the Spirit. And we have the Spirit in us to be kind to people. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. So we didn't do anything to be saved. Jesus did it all for us. And we have His grace as evidence of that. And not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. And so we have these good works to do not for our salvation but for, for Jesus. And that leads us to 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter. 
We were created to do good works in Jesus' name. Jesus is still ministering His reconciliation for us with our Father. And our Father wants us to join with Jesus in His ministry. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 14. For Christ's love compels us. That's why we're here today listening to this message about our risen Lord. Because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. We all participate in His death. We did that on Good Friday, and now we do it today for His life. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died for them and was raised again. So here we are. We're at this point. He's raised again. What are we participating with Him? What are we doing? Verse 16, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. So we, we all, believing in Him, have the Spirit living in us, and therefore He is living in us. Verse 17, therefore if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. See, it's already here in us, in Christ. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God our Father. See, this is all because of God our Father, who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So our Father sent Him to us. How many times did Jesus say that? So that we would know that our Father sent Him to us. Well, another reminder right here. And because of that, He reconciled us to our Father as His children. And therefore... He's also given us the ministry of reconciliation. So who's doing this ministry of reconciliation? Anybody you know? I hope you know somebody, but I doubt very much that we know more than one person who's doing this. And the whole body of Christ needs to do it. You don't see any exceptions here, do you? We're all included in this. Why aren't we all doing this together as the church? So, this is what that ministry of reconciliation means. That God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And therefore, He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. So, you know all the false messages of reconciliation out there that don't accomplish a thing. We have the answer of a reconciliation that accomplishes much. First with our Father, then with ourselves and our neighbors and our communities. But the most important thing is that we participate with the fact that we're reconciled to our Father as His children with full rights of inheritance. Verse 20, we are therefore Christ ambassadors as though God were making His appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We need to be saying that to everybody we meet in this world today. For God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And that's what we have. We have a living high priest who understands exactly who we are today. And he says, come, my brothers and sisters, let's do this. Let's take this good news and take it to the world so they'll know why our Father sent him to us. It's because he loves us so much. Please join with me in prayer. We thank you. We thank you for today, dear God. Thank you, Father, for sending Jesus to us. Thank you for reconciling us to yourself, us to you, through his death and his resurrection. We live now today in the Spirit with a risen Lord, our Lord and Savior Jesus. And we ask and pray you help us to join with him in his ministry of reconciliation on this side of the cross to all the world, that no one will be missed. We ask and pray your blessing to be with us, that you'll help us to understand this wonderful message in the Spirit. We thank you, asking for your protection from Satan and his demons, and your guidance and direction this coming week through the Spirit. It's in the blessed and holy name of Jesus that we pray, and all together we say, Amen.